welcome to On The Media's very first live stream ever. Uh, good afternoon, I'm Joe Baker, a member of the Delaware Tribe of Indians. Good evening. My name's Jeff Spurgeon, and I want to welcome you to a special evening. You're going to be treated to a new performance by the Catalyst Quartet, a performance recorded live in the green space. This group has now covered music by Samuel Coleridge Taylor and by Florence Price in two previous episodes of this series. Tonight, this triad is completed with luminous music by Jesse Montgomery, George Walker, and Coleridge Taylor Perkinson. If you haven't seen part of this program before, it's a series called Uncovered, conceived by the Catalyst Quartet in 2018. And it's an ongoing performance and multi-volume anthology dedicated to some of the composers whose music has been overlooked by history, left out forgotten because of race or gender. They have an album now featuring work by Samuel Coleridge Taylor. It's out. They're just about ready to record the second in the series that will feature works by Florence Price. And then the third one, which is part of the program that they're presenting right here. Music that will begin with a work by Jesse Montgomery. The work is called Strum, and it's performed for you now by the Catalyst Quartet. Thank you. 
Music by Jesse Montgomery, a work called Strum, performed by the Catalyst Quartet, a recording made live in the green space. And with me now are the members of the Catalyst Quartet to talk about this work and this larger project. Violinist Carla Donahue Perez, violinist Abby Fayette, the violist Paul Laraya, and the cellist Carlos Rodriguez. How did you guys stumble across this piece? Carlos, take, take it away and tell us about your connection to Strum and Jesse Montgomery. Well, once upon a time, there was a violinist who liked composing a little bit. And she was a dear friend of the quartet and subsequently joined the quartet almost immediately after this event. Um, there was a piece that was basically a cello quintet and it was called Strum. And then it morphed into a string quartet with a different ending. And then Jesse reworked the piece with a new ending that you just heard for us many, many years ago. And the piece was conceived in a quartet rehearsal where she was sort of noodling around on the violin um, doing what you're not supposed to be doing in a quartet rehearsal, but it birthed Strum. So we're all grateful for that. And we've been playing the piece since it basically existed in this form and have recorded it on our second album called Strum, The String Works of Jesse Montgomery. And so since then, um, Jesse has gone on to become a full-time composer. And so we're very happy uh, and thrilled to see all the new work that she is and will be doing. And that's how, how Strum sort of came to be and came to us as a string quartet. And it's, it's a wonderful piece and audiences just go wild for it. So it was created in, in the quartet and it's got some special difficulties in it. So how do you hold it together and keep the balance and make sure that what is being, you want to have communicated at the moment is being communicated. And I'll let anybody answer who wants to. That one, um, you know, it's one of the things that I love about Jesse's music is the way that she uses texture um, within uh, her, her writing. And, and this piece, it's like so clear, all the pizzicato and um, the balance really is in, in um, creating the, the energy and keeping the uh, rhythmic um, sort of soul of the piece going. Uh, and um, I think having the composer in your quartet when you're learning a piece like that is just incredible. Uh, Jesse has an amazing ability uh, uh, with these kind of ex extended techniques. So we kind of all learned them with her and we all developed this style together. Um, and so, I mean, I think that's a huge part of it is that we had her there with us. So it was really great. It's an advantage to um, performers very often to have uh, a composer on hand. You don't have that advantage with most of classical music. The composers are dead. On the other hand, they aren't going to tell you, wait a minute, you guys aren't understanding this piece at all. So you've been doing this for a long time, uh, almost a decade or around a decade. Has that's it correct. changed? And, and has it changed for you? And has it changed for Jesse? Has, has there been additional dialogue and, and other adaptations? One large one, I think, but, but along the way, how's it changed? It, um, I think that for the, for the quartet, it, it changed in the sense of like, you know, every performance, you gain a little bit of, of knowledge of um, how to, uh, give the piece to the audience, how to communicate. Um, and it changed in that way. Um, and definitely for Jesse, it has, um, uh, as you said, it, it has changed into, um, it also exists as a chamber orchestra piece. And then also she has used pieces of it in other works of hers, like her ballet. Um, and so it kind of, the thing about Strom is that it, it is such an audience favorite. Um, it's almost become uh, sort of like, I, I would say probably her most popular work. Um, so it's definitely really important in that way. And so I think it'll continue to kind of live in, in different places. It's a, it's a calling card for her in a way. And it's also the title of, uh, of the CD, which I mentioned, the album that I mentioned 
um, RSEC and, and her um, complete string works at the time, Strum, yeah. Abby, um, how is it for you and, and Carla to, to do your parts in this work, knowing that Jesse is a violinist, maybe isn't a violinist, but maybe can still play? Does, any, does she ever come around and say, why don't you duck out? I'd like to sit in on this <laughs> for a minute. Well, she hasn't kicked me out of my seat yet, but you never know. Um, I mean, I think one of the things for me, um, I, as I just recently joined the quartet, um, just this past year, you know, having um, Paul and Carla and Carlos as resources who have worked with Jesse, they've toured with Jesse, they've played concerts with her, to have them as a resource to really help inform me, not only just sort of the technical aspects of playing her music, but also sort of the soul of her music, you know? And so I feel like even though I haven't talked to Jesse one-on-one -on -one about her music, I feel like I have because of just the incredible closeness that my colleagues have with her. So that has been such a really cool experience. It's almost as if, you know, she's kind of a, a fifth member in the room kind of speaking, speaking to us, which is awesome. I think that's wonderful too. And it's an analogy to the way that, that uh, we have to deal with classical music so much of the time to find the spirit of the composer who isn't usually available on this earthly plane. And so you, you do get to see that that can even happen with a living composer whom you have not personally met. I think that's a wonderful encouragement to people who are trying to find the spirit of the music. It's in there in the notes. And if you spend enough time with them, very often, you, you get really close to the composer. That's just terrific. Next on this program is George Walker's work called Lyric for String Quartet, part of a larger work of his, and also published though as a standalone piece. Now, you just performed Lyric, you Catalyst Quartet people at a concert that also featured Barber's Adagio for Strings and um, had an interesting response because the Barber Adagio, extremely familiar, the Walker Lyric, less familiar. So what happened? Well, this was a few years ago, and I believe the concert was in Healdsburg, California, at a wonderful space there. And George Walker was still with us. And we, ha we never met, we never got to meet George Walker, unfortunately, before he passed away not, not too long ago. Uh, we were very close with his sister, uh, Frances Walker Slocum. And she was a, a wonderful mentor and um, patron of ours in a way in a residency that we were doing at Oberlin College with the Sphinx Performance Academy. But we love George Walker's Lyric for Strings. It's one of the first pieces we ever played as a string quartet, and we were programming it a lot. And when we were playing this concert in Healdsburg, this tweet came in from George Walker. And I mean, he was very advanced in age at the time, and I, I personally and the quartet were shocked that he even knew what Twitter was when we were barely active on Twitter. And he sort of set down this gauntlet, as it were, in a way of why these, he says, why do these groups play only my second movement, my slow movement? Um, you know, it's a full string quartet um, and they play Samuel Barber's full string quartet. I mean, for us, the having the second movement published as a standalone work was reason enough for that. Um, but we are amending that. We're writing the ship in, in, the, in the creation of volume three of Uncovered, and we will be recording his entire string quartet. So he's not with us anymore. We can't tweet back and say, we're gonna get to it, but uh, we're doing it. But needless, wherever he is, I hope he, he hears it and appreciate, appreciates the fact that we are um, amending things. Another advantage of composers who are no longer on this earthly plane, they can't tweet you and criticize what you're doing. <laughs> oh well, life has its uh, advantages and disadvantages. Do you want to say anything about this piece be before, uh, before we get to the performance? Tell us a little bit about it. Um, I, I mean, it's probably one of the most beautiful works ever written. Um, it does get compared to Barbara's Adagio a lot. Um, and I think that although that is something that sometimes is maybe a little bit annoying or, or unfortunate that people want to compare the works, I think it's a testament to how beautiful the work is. 
And I do think that it, it can stand alone and that it, it, sh it, it, is, it, does, it does have its own um, language and its own color. Um, so in that way, I, I wish that it wasn't um, compared to it, but it, it's, it's an extremely gorgeous piece. And, um, you know, we love playing it and we hope that everybody enjoys it as much as we do. All right, from violinist Carla Donahue Perez, some thoughts on the work we're about to hear, which is the slow movement from George Walker's string quartet, his lyric for strings, the catalyst quartet plays it.
Catalyst Quartet and a work by George Walker, one of the movements from his string quartet, also published standalone his lyric for strings. I think it has a real advantage to hear this work uh, based on the discussion we had about its comparison to Barber's Adagio, which because it's been used, the Barber Adagio in so many other situations, it may bring other images. Whereas the Walker, you hear just as a piece of music. I think we have a real advantage right now, maybe as it moves further into the world, uh, it will become associated with some kind of image or film or something. But you watching this program have just the connection of the Catalyst Quartet to that piece. All right, uh, Jesse Montgomery, George Walker, the third composer on this program is Coleridge Taylor Perkinson. And uh, we'll turn to the violist who, following string quartet convention, is the last person to speak in any given situation. So um, Paul Lariah, tell us about uh, the quartet's connection to, to Perkinson and the music that we're gonna hear next. Yes, yeah, so the Perkinson Quartet is one of my absolute favorites on, um, in the scope of our entire project. Um, it's just an incredible masterpiece in my opinion. And he takes the, um, the Calvary theme, which is so famous in black folk music culture, and he uses it as this amazing seed just to create this genesis of this incredible work. Every single movement has a, a motivic connection to it. And if, if you're not familiar with Perkinson's music, it's full of so many different styles um, from, he was fluent in jazz, he was fluent in um, you know, popular styles. Um, he composed for dance. He was a really amazing guy, an amazing composer. And the work is just, almost without, you almost can't define it. There's no other work quite like it. When you talk about the Calvary theme, um, is there a way for us to get a little advance notice on that? Can you tell us what that is or sing a note, a few notes of it, just so that we sort of have a clue, those of us who might not be in it? <laughs> Calvary. <laughs> just that. All right. <laughs> I mean, there's a little bit more. I mean, if I was a if I was a vocalist, I wouldn't be playing viola. <laughs> I would I would turn the our, I would turn our, our listeners and our viewers and our audience to a, an incredible recording that exists on YouTube and other places. I'm sure of Mahalia Jackson singing um, singing this song, and it's really just uh, breathtaking and really profound. Okay. The and for for us also, Perkinson's music is is special because one of our early mentors, um, Sanford Allen, who was the first black member of the New York Philharmonic, he was appointed by Leonard Bernstein. Um, he had a very very close relationship with Perkinson and Perky as he called him and commissioned a lot of his solo violin works and other chamber works. And knowing Sanford so well, um, there is a, a connection to the composer for us um, in turn. And I, I personally had the great fortune of playing Perkinson's string trio with Sanford. And that was a, an illuminating experience into the style of Perkinson's music. Once again, a wonderful connection that you have and can bring to the other members of the of the quartet. Um, uh, maybe Abby, you could tell us a little bit more about the structure of the piece, movements, mood. Uh, just give us a, a little view of the road ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So the quartet is in three movements, and it's in a uh, fast, slow, fast form. Um, the outer two movements are although they're very different, um, Perkinson kind of brings the piece full circle by reintroducing the Calvary theme back in the third movement, but sort of more in kind of like a fugue kind of style where actually each, all of us in the quartet find ourselves almost chasing after one another, which creates this really, really exciting texture. Um, what I find really interesting about the outer two movements is their similarities are just as many as their differences. But the way that um, Perkinson takes a motivic kernel, you know, something as simple as the da 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 yum, which is a very tiny motivic kernel, he sort of 
he takes it from its smallest building block and he builds and he builds and he builds and builds. And then all of a sudden you have this like large section where he's sort of transformed this tiny few note kernel into this really incredibly complex sort of contrapuntal um, sort of fugato sort of texture, which is really cool. And that's definitely an element that you hear distinctly in the first and the third movement. The second movement is really interesting because I find it kind of have this very sort of ethereal um, vibe about it. It starts off with just a, just the singular violin pitzing an ostinato um, no, quarter note line. And then introduces this, you know, sort of curious, um, sort of unknowing, kind of almost lamenting um, sort of motive in the viola, which in Perkinson's style, of course, again, here you have that small kernel that he then takes throughout the movement and develops. And within the second movement, again, as he ends the movement, just as in the same way that he begins with just a singular violin with that Pitts Ozzonato, very eerie, a little bit creepy, but an amazing, amazing colorscape that he creates. Thank you for that. That's wonderful. So we have a connection to the composer. Um, we have a little bit of the structure of the work and a little bit of where it comes from. So let's hear it now. The string quartet number one of Coleridge Taylor Perkinson, the Calvary Quartet, performed for you now by the Catalyst Quartet in the green space. <laughs> Thank you. 
with a basis in a traditional song and as violinist Abby Fayette, a work built out of, out of little kernels into a great structure. You just heard Coleridge Taylor Perkinson's String Quartet Number no. 1, the Calvary Quartet, performed in the green space by the Catalyst Quartet uh, as we conclude the third of this three-program series um, that is a continuing series by the Catalyst Quartet called Uncovered. So Catalyst members, how long have you been playing this, this quartet, this uh, Perkinson work? The Perkinson, um, well, the Uncovered project started a few years ago, actually. And the Perkinson Quartet was not new to us as far as knowing of the piece, but learning it, I think in the last, last season was when we actually like got our heels and our heels and boots dirty um, in learning this piece and have been performing it in whichever way we could in this past year with all the challenges. Um, but it's been about a year that we've been working on the piece and it's, I, I say one of the more difficult pieces in the repertoire, but so rewarding in the end. You're all nodding your head. What, why is it of a particular challenge? Because the other works on this program are, are no walk in the park necessarily. Right. Even the walker is one of the more, most difficult pieces we've ever played in its own. Every, every piece, I think, if you want to play it well, is hard. But there are just some rhythmic and technical difficulties in the Perkinson that are gnarly to, to handle. And there's a, lot, there's a lot of dense writing. And so it's hard to sort of illuminate the things that you want to bring out in a more clear, lean way. And so there are challenges everywhere, everywhere with this piece. Anybody else on that? Well, Jeff, I think, you know, going back to what I was saying about these little kernels of motive, the more Perkinson develops them, the more difficult they are to bring out as Carlos was saying. So, and even to just really get into the nitty gritty and, and, and you know, even though there's only four voices playing in this quartet at once, there's a lot of material to dive into, to sort through and to figure out what to bring out because so much of the texture is so dense as Carlos was saying. Oh, I'd like to add well, another particular difficulty is that um, Perkinson is constantly using jazz age harmonies, you know, seventh, ninth chords, 11th, like so many advanced chords that just are a real extra challenge to tune because in traditional mm -hmm. quartet tuning, we're used to this sort of like Bach chorale style situation going on when you have so many layers of tones that are might seem like they're dissonant, but in the grand scheme, they're not. It's a very difficult thing. It takes time. Well, and as you mentioned earlier, um, Paul, um, Perkinson had such versatility in the music that he made and the styles he understood. And he was right there in the thick of things when, when jazz was nascent and when so much richness was, was uh, was coming forth in American music. So once again, we reflect on the disaster of the way these composers, all the people on this program and all the people in this Uncovered series were shunted aside because of tastes at the time and the other considerations in society. It wasn't just a musical bias, it was a bias across society, one that continues, but one that you, Catalyst Quartet people, are uh, battling against in a really wonderful way, which is to say, here's some music you haven't heard, and when you hear it, you're going to love it. And, and so we are all enriched by it. So uh, let me mention real quickly that this project continues, the Catalyst Quartet's Uncovered project continues, and they would appreciate your uh, learning more about it and offering some support if you can. So if you go to catalystquartet.com, you'll learn a great deal more about it. Thanks to um, uh, our Catalyst Quartet members, Carla Donahue Perez and, um, and Paul Lariah, violinist and violist, and they're not just in the same room by coincidence. They are married, answering the question you were wondering about but had no way to ask, so there you are. Um, and uh, violinist Abby Fayette and cellist Carlos Rodriguez. You're all fabulous people. You're doing fabulous work, and we're so glad that you were here with us in the green space for all of these three uncovered programs. We'll be looking forward to more from you, I know. Thank um, you, Jeff. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Great pleasure that you were all here. And uh, here at the Green Space, we're going to be announcing some other programs very soon. The Harlem Chamber Players are going to be 
here presenting some of their performances as well and some other WQXR artists too. And the best way to find out about that is by subscribing to our newsletter, which you can do at thegreenspace.org. I'm Jeff Spurgeon speaking for everyone behind the scenes and the quartet. Thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening.